Hi, I'm Larry Dignan, and we're here with Tony Utley. He is president of Honeywell Quantum Solutions. Thanks for joining us, Tony. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So you, Honeywell and Cambridge Quantum basically uh, merged and, you know, kind of kind of set off a lot of interesting discussion in the community. Um, so I guess just walk me through the basics of the deal and, and sort of the rationale behind it. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, I think it helps us to understand that. So Honeywell Quantum Solutions and Cambridge Quantum Computing have been working together for three years. Um, no company outside of Honeywell has had more access, more time on our systems than CQC. And in fact, the first company outside of Honeywell to ever have access to one of our development systems was CQC. So over this entire time, we've been able to do the thing you want to do most, which is interact so closely that we know their team, we know their scientists, we know their platform, so we know their application space. And the same thing goes for us. They know our systems, they know our teams and our capabilities. And you build that mutual trust, you build that mutual respect. And it became very clear that we could do more together. Absolutely. So why this? Um, we are creating, we're, we're doing a combination is what we're calling it, uh, which is actually pretty new for Honeywell. Uh, we're taking Honeywell Quantum Solutions and we are taking it and separating it out from Honeywell and combining it into this new company with Cambridge Quantum Computing. Uh, together, we will become the biggest standalone full stack quantum computing company on the planet. Uh, and one of the drivers around that, and there are many, but one of the drivers was that over the past 18 months uh, and in increasing amounts, uh, we have had companies coming to us to ask to invest directly into Honeywell Quam Solutions. And that has been increasing. That's, that's a kind of an interesting thing when you're a part of a big company and somebody comes and says, hey, can I go invest in that one specific part of your company? Uh, and if you look at why, so quantum has the potential to be such an incredible uh, industry. Uh, and then combine that with what we did over the last 18 months, which is in March of 2020, we said three months from now, we're going to be releasing the world's most high-performing quantum computing. And despite the pandemic, we did that. And then we said, we're going to be increasing our quantum volume by an order of magnitude every year for the next five years. And then we started to just release the data time and time again as we made those capability expansions. And we became a part of the entire ecosystem that people could look at and say, wow, they're actually doing what they said they were going to go do, even in this really nascent and, uh, and technology dependent industry. And that generated even more enthusiasm for people who wanted to be a part of this. Uh, this new company provides that investment vehicle. It provides that ability for, for those organizations who are thinking about investing in quantum, but didn't really know where they, they wanted to put it. Did they want to invest in a large company that this was a small part of? Did they want to invest in a startup? Uh, this becomes the inflection point company within quantum computing. So Cambridge, I mean, when I first looked at the deal, I instantly thought vertical integration, right? Because Cambridge is bringing a lot of software to the table and their platforms. Honeywell obviously has the hardware, but, but then again, Cambridge is also hardware agnostic. So how's, how's the new company kind of going to walk that line and, and how should you know, prospective customers think about it? I think the, importantly, Cambridge Cloud Computing for its entire existence has been hardware agnostic. And going forward, it will continue to be hardware agnostic. Uh, that is what you, that's, that's part of the benefit that you get from being able to work with experts who are in different application spaces like cybersecurity, like chemistry, like machine learning, uh, to be able to understand which use cases should really go to which systems. And they've had that kind of access to various hardware and that kind of time working with various hardware manufacturers to understand 
this is how you go and, and take that job, even potentially the entire job and split it into pieces that matter most. Uh, so that's, that's going to stay. Um, so again, why then, how does this fit into a, an integration of vertical integration, which it absolutely does. And that is because we have the ability to tailor our systems for applications. Uh, and like many manufacturers, we have a roadmap that is a expansion of a universal quantum computer. Uh, universal quantum computer sounds great, uh, but what is kind of left out of that is it's like saying I have a medium sized t-shirt that everybody gets to wear. Um, you know, if, if you say I want to take some unknown number of people and move them from point A to point B in some un amount, unknown amount of time, you may build a minivan because you want to try to take care of as many different outcomes as possible. But if somebody said, I want one person to go from point A to point B as fast as humanly possible, you'd probably build a Formula One car. And so in addition to this idea of saying, we're going to have generation after generation of a universal quantum computer, we have the ability to actually tailor around specific applications for which we can be most efficient. And in particular, trapped ion lends itself to things like chemistry and material science really well because you have this all-to-all -all connectivity, you have this very long coherence time, the ability to have extremely high fidelities. Uh, similarly, there's applications in cybersecurity that our trapped ion quantum computer is able to be advantaged for. And so it is, it is the idea of saying, if I had the ability to design the hardware and the operating system and the applications all together, could I make that experience be a absolutely seamless, pristine one for our customers? We believe the answer is yes. So, so it'll be, if I'm, if I'm hearing that right, so it'll basically be, there'll be optimized systems for workloads basically. For yeah, certain, certain for specific applications even. Yeah, it might, might be an entire chemistry um, platform that gets developed. So, so for like IT decision makers who are, you know, looking at quantum, you know, and viewing it more as a cloud service today, and but thinking about the other stuff, is is this partnership with Cambridge almost akin to kind of the Dell and VMware thing, where VMware is sort of, you know, they're hardware agnostic too, but you know, you do have some integration between the two comp between Dell and VMware that are, you know, optimized experiences. Designing around a specific application is meaningfully different, right? Like you, you we, we will have different trap designs to go and target specific types of, of use cases. Um, and, and then you have to think about how do you actually implement that? You know, so, so what part of this gets put directly into an end customer's operations in order to harness this particular application? You know, is it we're developing a specific class of molecule and therefore it is going to be a dedicated system basically with a set of operating systems and, and uh, applications on it that could very well be. So I, I see particularly over this next five to seven years, a lot of tailoring. Um, I think we will eventually get to a point where there is uh, a bit more universality of access, but in order to accelerate the entire industry's ability to create value from quantum computing, I think this specificity is actually going to be really important. So it's less about verticals, more about use cases and workloads. Correct. So what is this, what is this combination going to mean to, for developers? So there are a lot of developers out there who are, you know, they might be Python or whatever. And, and, you know, a lot of the quantum players are trying to build that bridge between, you know, languages we use today versus what will be used for quantum and kind of bridging that. What, what does Cambridge bring to the table for that? Yeah, I, I, think, I think this whole new company puts us in a fabulous place to be a, uh, a part of collaboration for the ecosystem and, and not competition. So, you know, there's, there's been this dialogue about you know, Honeywell's competing exactly with IBM or competing with Google. Um, that's not the case. We're, we're really early in this technology. 
And the, the idea that you could have even a particular algorithm for which one part of it gets done really efficiently on a superconducting system, and there's another part of it that gets done really efficiently on a trapped ion system, that is a real thing. And it needs to be able to be explored so that we can make sure that we're getting the most total value out of quantum computing. And this puts us in a position to be able to have those kinds of, of collaborations. Uh, similar on the application side, which is if we go, which we plan to do to have a quantum operating system that really allows then companies out there that are working on an application specific area to be able to plug in. And then that application specific area could get routed to, again, whichever hardware does that job best. That allows for that connectivity and that allows for that collaboration that might not have otherwise been possible. So we really view it as a acceleration of collaboration across the system. Yeah, because because I guess at this point it's it's kind of looking for that killer application or looking for that thing that'll make quantum more usable for multiple enterprises. Yeah, I mean one of the things to keep in mind is that you know the, the scarcest resource in quantum is the human resource right now. This is a amazing opportunity to bring this incredible talent pool together. If we if we closed today would have 320 of the most capable people in, in quantum computing. We expect that to be 350 by the time we actually close because we are expanding so fast. We'll have over 120 different PhDs, uh, over 200 scientists that across hardware, operating system, different application spaces are, are set up to be able to go and drive the acceleration of quantum computing. So it really provides this incredible opportunity to start to move the talent base uh, forward as well. So Honeywell is investing, I think it was roughly 300 million into the new company. Um, so when it when it combines and closes, it'll be open to outside investors basically? Yeah, it will be. And, and there's a, there is a designed intentionality around this continued interaction with Honeywell. So. The last decade, we have developed our ion traps at a trusted foundry that is run by the Honeywell Aerospace business. We have a long-term supply agreement that we will continue to have that level of interaction so that we are staying vertically integrated from the trap all the way up through our system. Uh, we expect Honeywell to be, if not our best, one of our best customers. We have ongoing projects right now within our aerospace business, within our performance materials and technologies business, where the intent is to use the outcome of this, of this quantum capability in those businesses. Uh, Darius Adamczyk himself, the, the chairman and CEO of Honeywell, is going to be the non-executive chairman of the board of this company. And so it's, this is not a Honeywell just got rid of this. This was Honeywell absolutely wants to set this entire new company up for success. And one of the ways to go do that is to say, we believe in it so much, we're also going to put in another $300 million cash to say it is, it is set up for success. But it provides this investment vehicle now for other people who have been out there wondering, is this the right time to get into quantum and have been talking to us over and over again to say, yep, it is, <laughs> it is time to get into quantum. And, uh, and I have to say that the, the outreach that has happened since this announcement has been, uh, has been pretty profound. So the other investors would be venture capitalists, companies, things like that, correct? Yeah, I expect there to be a lot of uh, strategics, a lot of people who are interested in, in technology. Plus, this is a company and this is a technology that's going to play out over decades, right? It's not about next quarter. It's not about next year. It's about people who understand that this is about massive, not just growth, but about creating a space that to a large extent doesn't even exist. And so we have to go and put in the resources to go do that. Um, and the investors who are trying to be a part of this absolutely know that to be true. What are what are some of the areas where that three hundred million would go into? I mean, is, is, it, is it talent? <laughs> is it infrastructure? What I guess what's yeah. I, I always say nouns. It's going to go into nouns. People, places, things. 
Um, but no, a lot of it's going to be growth of, of the talent. Um, we are doing continued rapid expansion of the, of the hardware capabilities. Um, those, that hardware has to exist in very specifically designed facilities. Now, these, these systems are, they're exceptional sensors, right? They, they know when there's the most modest vibration. They know when there is a swing in temperature. They know when there's a swing in humidity or even airflow. Uh, and so you have to design the facilities, you have to design the, uh, the machines themselves, the systems themselves, and you have to have the talent base to go do that. And so all of that plan has been developed here and uh, we expect to be able to, uh, to grow and use that capital to do that. So on the talent front, um, obviously there's a shortage of folks. Um, how, how do you see that developing over time? I think it's going to come from a number of different places. Uh, first is there has to be a place where talent wants to get drawn into. Um, and as exciting of an area as quantum computing is, you know, people who are starting to go through college right now, or maybe even earlier than that in high school and thinking, should I be into this, you know, going into this space? They want to see companies like this new company forming together to say, oh, I, I want to be a part of the start of that. And so I think we're going to see, you know, an increase in talent pool. And it's going to be global. It's absolutely going to be global and it's going to be multidisciplinary. So this, this isn't just physicists. It absolutely needs absolutely needs a type of physicist, but uh, this is software developers. This is algorithm. This is uh, folks that are, you know, from our side, particularly in supply chain, uh, in engineering, in every discipline from mechanical to electrical, both on digital and analog. I mean, this is a, you have to continue to build out the entire multi multidisciplinary team. And that was one of the big parts of Honeywell's uh, contribution here is that we took a terrific science organization and absolutely surrounded it with the kernel of what Honeywell has always done really well, which is complex system integration and exceptional controls capability. And what any at scale quantum computer needs are those two things, the ability to do complex system integration and controls. Uh, and so we have packaged that in ability to now combine it with people who are, they have been thinking about and building the operating system layer and the applications that go on top of it. Uh, and it, it's going to be pretty special. Do you, would you say that the new company, you know, the primary distribution for what the new company builds will be through the cloud? Or do you see that changing over time? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I, I think access is going to be cloud-based for quite a, quite a while. You know, the, the intellectual property is still, in, the, in terms of the, the trapped ion machines, is still tied up in the machines themselves. And so they're likely to stay housed in uh, well-protected uh, places where, where that IP is going to be carefully managed. Now, having said that, do I imagine that there's future scenarios where... Um, systems will be physically located in other places to be able to support particular use cases or particular geographic needs. Yeah, I think that's going to ultimately go that way. But for right now, you know, we have been doing very small numbers of these generations. So just two of the system model H1, totally. Now why? Because system model H2 is already built. It's physically built. It's already running. Uh, and so of the H1s because the next generation is, is coming. And so we have this ability to build these generations so fast that you know our, our intent is to keep on pushing the boundaries on what that's what's possible and then add those systems when it has those applications that have already been been designed. Okay. Um, is there a name for the new company? <laughs> Do you have one? <laughs> my, my no, detail. unfortunately, unfortunately, we do not yet have a have a name selected, but we will have one prior to the uh, the closing date. Thanks for joining us and giving us a quick overview. It was my absolute pleasure. Happy to be a part of it.